This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. It is with great pleasure that I introduce that this chat features Phil Susan, one of the greatest working bass players in rock and roll history. The guy has done it all. He is one of my absolute favorites. He and Joey Vera, actually, from Anthrax and Fate's Warning and now King Diamond. I mean, these guys are the working bass players. These guys are the soul of the machine, if you like. A little bit about Phil Susan. He was the bassist in Ozzy Osbourne's band for a couple of years there. He wrote his biggest ever hit, which you'll hear all about throughout the chat. So I'm not going to spoil it here. But elsewhere, he's worked with Vince Neil, Billy Idol, Kings of the Sun, they're an Aussie band, they're here on the Gold Coast, and he's done a ton of sessions and live appearances with the likes of Toto, Janie Lane, Richie Kotzen, so many others. Now, the catalyst for our introduction is a Last in Line album. It's called Jericho. It'll be out at the end of March. It's pretty bloody good, I've got to say. But look, with a chat like this, I've got to talk about all the other stuff as well. So Last in Line gets gets a, a little bit of a mention, it's fair to say, but Phil has just done so much other cool stuff. It was an opportunity for me to basically riff. I didn't have any questions prepared specifically for Phil, so I was going from my memory here. So a good example of what happens when you've been a fan of somebody's for a while and then you get an opportunity to have a chat with them. Well, here it is. And so here he is, the great Phil Susan. Hello, Andrew. Bill, I didn't expect this, and I am absolutely thrilled to be chatting with you, sir. I've been a long-time fan of yours. I'm a bass player, so. Oh, wow, terrific. <laughs> yeah, so I was expecting. I, I got a call this morning, actually, from our management. I don't know what's going on, but he said, uh, he said can you, can you uh, do a couple of these interviews? And So I said, sure, I'd be delighted to. It so happened that I'm, I've got some time today, so here I am. Oh, I'm just thrilled, Phil. I've, I think the best song ever written, I'll say it now, is um, your song. The oh, Aussie song, "Shot oh, in the Dark." You. Thank you. I was a uh, yeah. That's a uh, that's a. Uh, uh, I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, please do, please do. Yeah, I, I've covered it, and I've seen the reaction on people's faces, and I've sat down and I've studied it. Your bass line, the intricacies, the interplay between the keyboard, the vocal line, and the bass line. Then, of course, there's Jake's magnificent guitar line in there, and and the the lyrics as well. And that's just one of those perfect songs. There's very few of them, but that's one of them. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Yes, it definitely, <laughs> definitely evolved over some time. And I think it's, uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, I think you nailed a few of the musical things. I mean, the influences for that song would be, uh, you'd, you'd be quite surprised at how, div- how diverse those influences were. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Was that, was that one that you had for years beforehand or did you write that specifically for that session? No, I had that a long time. I had it for a long time. I originally wrote it a long time before, um, and then uh, we covered it in one of my be- one of the bands I was in. But they wanted to change uh, all the lyrics and make some other changes to it, and never released it. And then it sat in my drawer. And then eventually, um, when Ozzy was looking for another song, uh, came around to asking us if we had songs. I played him three songs, and that was one of them. But um, yeah, it was my with the it was the original version I played him, and that's that's the one that became the one that everyone knows. So, yeah, magnificent. St- stood the test of time, big time. I just I wish Camp Osborne would pull their finger out and remaster that album and give you guys the collective on that album, including Bob. I know Bob was a part of the album as well with the songwriting. It's it's yes, just he wrote, you. I think he wrote he wrote um him he wrote uh, on the the entire rest of the record, didn't he? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, very I odd. I mean, as you well know, it's a very odd scenario there with Camp Osborne through the eighties and majority of the nineties. It's as yeah. as you bloody well know, mate. It's to do this or else, and then maybe you'll get paid. And, yeah, um, I mean, I, I sort of kind of uh, knew it, you know, going into it. Um, I, I I had a great time with with Ozzy during the uh, Ultimate Sin uh, period, and we did some incredible stuff. Um, as a, a real highlight, of course. And then when it got to the end, you know, I really wasn't able to, uh, you know, I had the option to move on and, and carry on with another record and actually do a lot more writing. If mm. I could cut a deal I, I was happy with and I really wasn't a- finding myself able to cut the deal that I would be happy with. So I elected to kind of, um, you know, uh, move on and switch gears and go, go play with Billy Idol. Um, but yeah. um, for other people, um, 
you know, they, I, so I'm, I'm not that disgruntled about anything as well. I'm saying to you, okay, I think cool. it works yeah. out just fine, but I know other people, um, not everybody has the same story to tell. Um, uh, but you know, I, I sort of, I sort of, I sort of knew it as I was going into it. I, I found that I was, I was trying to cut this deal and I was, I, I was saying, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to be able to cut this deal. And, um, and so maybe it's just time for me to sidestep here and to do something different. Because so, your career, your career's had a lot of highlights, though. Is that the highlight from a commercial perspective? Do you think, like in terms, because it's a number one song. It's like your song was number one on Billboard. Yeah. So people, yeah, I, I, I without any doubt, that, of course, that's a highlight. And um, there are other things which, to me, were a highlight as well, and for different reasons. There was some songs that I wrote where where I thought they were really superlative songs, which that was a highlight for me. Uh, having a song that I wrote getting nominated for a Grammy was another highlight, which was for someone else. Um, so, and, and then of course the highlights of some of my moments on the solo albums that I put out have also been highlights as is some of the work I'm doing with last in life. So for mm. different reasons, it's all been good. It's all been good. You know, you can't, but, but I can't, you know, I won't turn around and, uh, uh, you know, it's like that. Um, it's like that thing when you get some star that has a big hit and, Everyone goes mm. to see it. They said, well, why didn't you play the hit? Because well, I'm fed up with hearing that song. Yeah. You have to pay tribute to the song that got you there. So, you know, so you do have to, you also have to acknowledge and, you know, acknowledge that to what it is. And it was a, it was a, it was a tremendous highlight. Mm. The, the song is a highlight in the broader Dio Black Sabbath universe. So in what you're doing here with paying tribute, you know, in a roundabout way, I know the band has sort of since evolved from a so-called legacy act. It's far more than that, by the way. I'm talking about Last in Line. But do you think you'd ever bring that song into a set list? What, Shut in the Dark into? To, yeah, to, in Last in Line, yeah. I don't think it would be in this band. I don't think that would be um, appropriate. Um, I think that, you know, we've wrestled with a little bit of a thing um, where people have not been sure whether Last in Line is a tribute band or a heritage band or hmm. what it is. I mean, I, I know it certainly started out uh, with a nod to uh, to the original Dio band. I know they got together for, for old time's sake to have a play and see how it how it came out, and they did some shows. Uh, and that was the origins of the band. But the band is now, um, has proven itself to have um, some legs has has kind of moved on to uh, to show that it has some evolution and some creativity, and it's also had some some um, reception, um, and uh, and it's built a lot of traction. So I don't know that that would be something that we would probably do. Um, and I mean, if they turned around to me and said, "Hey, we want to do the song," I wouldn't say no. But I don't know that that's something I would bring up and say, "Hey, mm. I think we should do the song." But I do appreciate and respect why you're saying that. Yeah, it's it's just one of those tracks. I'm surprised it hasn't been covered by Selena Gomez or someone like that because it's got pop sensibility about it, but it's just straight-ahead rock and roll. And if you listen to – I've got young daughters, you see, so I know yeah. all about these Selena Gomez's and yeah. Taylor Swift's and stuff. So – Selena Gomez, that was the thought that came to me the other night because I think about these sort of things and go, wow, her management should contact you and just just say, hey, how can, can we cover this song and and see what goes from there because it, it could live another life again. You know that one. Well, phone's right here. <laughs> they don't need to call me. <laughs> just go ahead and cover it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, I, I just love that track. So just, yeah, it was so, so unexpected that we have this, I have this opportunity to talk to you and you're one of those blokes that I've been looking forward to talking to for decades, to be honest with you. So, uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> Thank you very and, much. Uh, yeah, just talking about Last in Line then. Okay, so the new album, it's titled Jericho. So what, what do you want to share with me about it? Is there anything specific about the album that you think is worth mentioning? No, not really. I mean, um, the, Jer the Jericho title was uh, um, uh, came from one of the songs, obviously. and But we also thought that the... The title Jericho represented um, something which, which is like breaking down some walls. I mean, that's the story, isn't it? Jericho is breaking down these walls. And what we went through, I think what we all went through this last couple of years has been challenging to say the least, you know, with whether it's division, whether it's people's, uh, um, you know, challenges in terms of isolation, in terms of, you know, my, my wife's a shrink. I mean, she's a, 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 a health right. counselor. 
And she's, you know, she spent a couple of years walking people off the ledge. I mean, she'll tell you, it's been very difficult for people, for everybody. And, um, and uh, you know, some, some tragedies and some... So with all of these things, we just feel like this is, you know, trying to break through all of this and get to the other side and get to something that's much, much better break down mm. these walls and that, for that reason i think jericho was very timely and was very um relevant mm. uh you've already kind of mentioned it during interviews and conversations with people do people have this perception that the band is just ultimately just a tribute to dio some people ask that um i i would think though they that most of the time i think they're, they're people who are, might not be 100 percent familiar with what we're doing so they just, they're, they're a little confused. They say, well, oh, that's the Dio band, right? And we say, well, sort of, but kind of not. I mean, Vivian and Vinny and, and, and the late Jimmy, of course, were part of the very early Dio moments, the first two, actually first three albums. But mm. those first two albums were the monumental albums. And they created those and then they moved on. Um, so that was, the, that was the, the extent of the involvement with Dio. Um, now this band is uh, is really uh, about those personalities, and it's about continuing seeing where they evolve to, and combining with myself and Andrew Freeman, um, seeing where we you know where 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 we four individuals might might be taking that influence from today. So there's been some you know some 35 years of passage between those records, and now, and so everyone's evolved in a certain amount, a certain extent. And so we have been creating, um, you know, music that is very different from what would have been created back then. But the roots come from the same place. I like to describe it as the, the DNA of this band. Mm -hmm. You know, it lives, it comes from Dio, but yeah. uh, it's it's evolved to you know quite a bit since then. Yeah. Now, does Andrew? Do you guys have a lot of say in Andrew's lyrics, and by extension? Do you guys bring in a lot of Dio references or any Dio references from the past, like uh, Easter eggs, you know, that term Easter eggs, so to speak, into the lyrical things? Yeah, no, I don't think so. Andrew Andrew tends to come up with a lot of lyrics himself. There's sometimes he'll come up and say, you know, hey, uh, I'm not really sure about this one, or or I'll say, hey, I've got some ideas for something. Um, you know, last album I wrote a uh, lyric for one of the songs. Um, but, uh, you know, we work collaboratively together, but... I, Honestly, he comes up with most of the stuff, and um, he has a, a very uh, extensive and diverse range of influences himself, and it's certainly not tied to just that era. He's very much like yourself, you know. He's got he's hearing stuff from 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 all over, from every single direction. Stuff that you know I might not want to listen to, or I might not listen to, and he's mm -hmm. he finds it, he appreciates that, and he he brings those influences in. So before we go back to uh, trying to you know pull out some influences from the past Dio catalogue. There's all of this wealth of modern information which is around and modern influences. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, fair enough, yeah. Now, I, I read the presser, and I think Vivian was saying that the band jams on the tracks live first mm -hmm. before going into the studio. So can uh, being a musician, I know sometimes I just had a rehearsal last night and it was like banging my bloody head against a brick wall, to be honest with you, with my poor old guitarist. So do you, how, do you, how do you iron out differences of opinion in the rehearsal room? We don't. We don't have differences of opinion. What we do is we try everything. It's pretty mm. obvious that what's, what's going to happen. I mean, it's odd. We don't really get that. There's no sort of passionate, you know, brawls or arguments about anything. It's um, Viv's one of the most... Um, as a guitar player, because you mentioned guitar players, Vivian is one of the most uh, uh, open to trying anything people I've ever met. They say, well, hey, how about we do this? And we go to that and he'll look, all right, let's try it. And then we'll try it in, er in earnest. And uh, it's pretty evident whether it's something works or if it doesn't work. And everyone will turn around and go, yeah, that sounds great. Or no, that doesn't sound so great. Let's, let's try something different. Uh, so it's a, very, it's a very cooperative collaboration and it's certainly a very friendly one. I've never... It's, I've never been in a band that's been that quite that kind of accepting of everything, <laughs> you know, to try everything out. And we do everything on the fly. I mean, we really do. We go in there with nothing. We 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 go in there with the one of these, one of these, and you plug it in, and that's all you got. And then we just start playing, and we mm. see what we come up with. You know, so many bands 
Um, I'm sure you can appreciate this as a musician, come in with a bunch of demos, say, okay, well, here's my demos. And everyone sits down and has a solo project listening party and decide what, how, what songs we're going to work on and try to mm. adapt. In this one, that's actually discouraged. We don't bring in anything. In fact, at one time I suggested, hey, I've got some ideas and people's like, no, 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 no. Let's just go in and we'll plug in and see what happens. That's where the magic happens. So that's what mm. we do. It's very granular. It's organic. interesting. <laughs> Just on on that point about uh, being organic and working with musicians and all that sort of thing, I've got one of the questions I was going to ask Andrew was tell me about working with Phil Suzanne. So there you go. So <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it's like. It's a pain in the ass. He's, he's a real jerk, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Is, um, it, is it still is it still exciting? I get the impression I, I can, I'm getting the vibe that playing music and doing what you're doing here is still very exciting for you. It is absolutely. It's the only thing. It's the only thing I want to do, and it's the only thing I always wanted to do. And as frustrating as it gets sometimes, uh, it's the only thing in which I find some solace. So um, it's you know for me it's everything I love. I mean, I, I it, my dad said to me, if, you know, if you were uh, if you can find something you love doing. That, that you you would do even if you didn't get paid for it that you know that's what you do you never work a day in your life and when I finally went to him and I said to him I've decided I'm going to play music he said to me anything but that <laughs> <laughs> my parents said something similar yeah I remember <laughs> are you, but, uh, kidding? You know, are you I, joking I think they said but yeah but it's worked it's clearly worked out really well for you though so dad must be your father must be really proud of where you've ended up he would have been he's not with us anymore unfortunately but um I think so, but it was difficult for him to stomach. I was actually a pre-med before that, so that wasn't a really great thing. Oh, right. Okay. Use, but, so, um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I will tell you, I mean, I never I never set out with the idea that I'm going to be successful. I didn't even know what that meant. Um, what I did, did, did know is, is I, I'd set myself some attainable goals, and, and I like to try to encourage people I speak with and when they ask me, how can I, how can I be a success? How can I get traction in this business? How can I do something in this business? And my answer is very simple. It's it's to set yourself some reasonably attainable goals, some things that you have a you know a, a, a chance to actually accomplish. Because if you do, then you can set a, a, a new goal very, very quickly. So my goal, for example, at the time was, look, if I can pay my bills doing what I do, I think I would consider that to be a success. And from that mm -hmm. point onwards, I started to sort of try to build upon that and uh, the rest of it sort of, you know sort of takes care of itself in the meantime I still was very much in love with I was with, with what I was doing and I wasn't frustrated if I wasn't able to do anything then I'd start getting frustrated with what I was doing and I'd start scratching my head and saying well maybe I should be doing something different you know maybe this isn't going to work for me all of those arguments that come in that end up in somebody you know falling to the wayside or, or, or abandoning what it is that they do um, so you have to set attainable goals, I think, reasonable mm -hmm. attainable goals. It's, you can't go into this saying, I want to win the World Series. Yeah. Like if you're a ball player, you know, you, you have to come in and say, well, I, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to hit a ball as best as I possibly can. And if I can do that, then maybe over a long period of time, the World Series will take care of itself. <laughs> right? Very true. Yeah, very true. Hey, I'll just do a time check. Have you got another one coming through in a couple in a minute or two's time? No, no, I got time to talk. I actually, I think that's you're you're you're, you're my last one for today. So okay, great. Time. That's yeah, it's tight time really well. And yeah, I'll just I'll ask a couple more questions as I say because sure. I've been looking forward to this opportunity for so long. Absolutely. You worked with I checked Wikipedia before. It says that you worked with uh, Clifford Hode. What's his band name? Sorry, I can't remember. Oh his yeah, band. Kings of the yeah. Sun. Kings of the Sun. There you go. Did you come to Australia for those sessions, or was that done abroad? No, 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 no. I did that over here. I got put in touch with them through uh, a couple of friends, and I, they asked me to. They needed somebody to play on a record, and uh, they were doing uh, uh, an album called Resurrection, mm. and we ended up doing it. Robbie Jacobs engineered it, and Danny Korchmar produced it. We ended up doing it at A and M Studios here, and I got to tell you, I had like probably the best time of my life playing with those two guys. I love Jeff and I love Cliff. They were absolutely stellar people. We had such a great time. At the end, they wanted me to join the band, but I would have had to come to move to Australia pretty much. Mm. And they weren't 100% sure about what they wanted to do, but uh, that album remains on one of my uh, my own playlists to this present day. I love the record. 
Oh, fantastic. <laughs> They're great yeah. people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's just down the road. He's a fellow Gold Coaster, actually. So uh, he frequents some right. of the places that I do. Yeah, he's a, he's a not. I've spoke. I haven't spoken to him. I had a few interactions with him online. But you're right. He, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the story about him and Guns and Roses. When they uh, tell, did he tell yes, you that story? I, I, know, I know some <laughs> shit went down with them, but and I could see where that would happen. And uh, but you know, it it um, in fact, I actually exchanged a, a message with Cliff about. But maybe maybe a month and a half ago, I just mm. saw something of his online, and I commented, and I went, I can't remember what I said. He wrote me back this little paragraph, and he said, "Phil, you know, great, you know, the greatest bass player we ever worked with. How's everything? Great to hear from you." So I'd love to get back in touch with him, and I don't know what happened between him and his brother. And I really don't know the story, but I love Jeff as well. Jeff mm. is such a superstar, you know. So, yeah, great band. One of those bands that. People who know within Australia feel like as though they're the big one that got away that just never happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that I, I, I can see that. I mean, they're just just the commerciality. I mean, they had the charisma of Billy Idol and they had the the rock of ACDC. They had the the aggression of a sort of punk band. They had a they had all of these cool things. I mean, it was just it's just a great band. What can I say? Yeah, no, definitely agreed. Yeah. And the long departed, uh, I always get his pronounce his first name incorrectly. I say Johnny, but it's Janie Lane, I think, isn't it? But you did some work with him, Jane, Janie Lane. Janie Lane, yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's it, yeah. Yeah, I played with I played with Janie in the la latter part of his years when he was basically working as a solo artist. I suppose he was going out as Janie Lane. Um, with uh, we had some great people in the band: Mike Fasano, Kerry Kelly. Um, uh, what's what, Go oh, and he he actually ended up finding Dario Lorena, believe it or not. Mm. That was the uh, Janie was the guy who, who discovered him is now with Black Label Society. There you go. And, yeah. uh, and Sean Zavardni, of course. Sean Z, his keyboard player. So I, I neglected to mention him. Sean was a very close close part close close person, probably the closest person with Janie. So that was a that was a it was a real honor. Janie was a terrific songwriter and a really 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 lovely guy. I know he had his demons and everything, but what a sweetheart of a guy he was, you know, and you want to do every, anything you possibly could for him. So, yeah, very so, misunderstood. I know, I know, I know. He wanted to disown Cherry Pie, but uh, that was the big hit, wasn't it? But he, uh, he, he long wanted to the the public to take to his more acoustic. I think it was more of his soulful, the soul songs that he was releasing. Releasing. Yeah, you know, it's really difficult. I, I, I'd hate for to be. I mean, to when that Cherry Pie came out, I mean. That almost co coincided with the end of the eighties for me, mm -hmm. you know. And it wasn't because of the song; it just was, you know. It was just uh, when that happened on the chronologically what, that moment, and so maybe there was an association with that as being the end of the the whole eighties thing, or I don't know what it was. But yeah, his other songs. I mean, I love like Uncle, Uncle Tom's Cabin is an incredible song. Mm. I love that, and I thought it was brilliant. I asked yeah. him how he wrote it one time, and he said he was. You remember the TV guide that they had in America because they had so many, too many TV stations. So they had a yeah. in their hotel they had a TV guide, and he was rummaging down there, and he said there was two titles of two films or two shows, and one was "I Know a Secret," and the other one was "Uncle Tom's Cabin." Right after it, and he went, "Wow, those two things go together." <laughs> and then that's where the inspiration came from, and so that was a, a kind of cool story, right? That's a killer story. Yeah the, yeah, the bit of insight that you get into these killer songs that we've been listening to for now decades, as I say. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What about what happened with Billy Idol? Because that was a big album, wasn't it? The yeah. one that you worked on with him. So with Charmed Life, was there talk of working with him afterwards or was it just the night? I mean, the 90s wasn't kind, was it? Let's face it. So was it just no. the 90s effect? We 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 got up. We, we we started off on the right foot. Everything started out started out very very good and and really a, a great situation. He'd moved from New York and he was now living in Los Angeles to make a fresh start, so to speak. And everything started out great. But to be honest, all of a sudden we started getting surrounded with some some people who had no business and surrounding anybody in the music. We had hangers on, bad characters, yeah. people who had nothing to do with the band, and all of a sudden a lot of really strange influences and and uh, a strange drama that was going on and it just turned into something where i just looked at this and said you know this isn't really what i signed up for i've got a career to be getting along with and, and i didn't appreciate some of the stuff that was going on um and 
you know, sometimes you just have to cut your losses, you know? So I was sad about that. I had a great time with Billy. I, I personally really got on well with him. He was a close friend. Um, and uh, every, it's always a delight to see him every time I do see him. He was always really super friendly. Mm. And I'm glad it's all sort of worked its way out, where it worked its way, worked itself out. But um, at that time, it was probably not something that was working out. Yeah, gotcha. And and Steve Stevens, I don't think, was on that album. I mean, the credits are often ambiguous, and there's a lot of ambiguity around the credits. Was it Rob Younger Smith or was it Steve Steven on this one? Steve no, it was Smith. Mark Younger Smith. Okay, Rob Young, Mark Younger Smith, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, Mark, yeah. Yes, because in fact, that was part of it. You know, when he moved out to LA, he wanted to put a whole new band together. Uh, he, uh, you know, he wanted to, um, uh, well, he wanted to put a band together with myself and Randy Castillo, actually. And Randy was oh, wow. originally in the first part of that band. We we cut the very first version of LA Woman together with Billy. And uh, it was a fantastic cut. I don't know what, what happened of it. It's disappeared. No one can find it. Um, and then for whatever reason, um, Randy did not end up in the band. I don't think that Billy's producer um, really got on very well with Randy. And so, um, you know, the, that didn't uh, carry on. Uh, but um, no, but Mark Younger Smith was the guitar player throughout the whole record. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You and Randy Castillo was certainly a partnership. It was. Uh, I was very. I was great. I think I did see him. I've got to check this. But when Ozzy came out in 1998, his first ever, unbelievably, he tried to come to Australia before the visa issues, or probably they. I don't think they were going to let him in. To be honest with you, beforehand, because of all of the the reputation that he had around that stuff. It was when Australia border security was still very conservative about things. But you mean, you mean Aussie? Aussie, yeah, yeah. I was just yeah, saying. We had, was... Plan, we had a plan to come there and, uh, you know, I'm going to move because I want to get on to, i got to put this thing on a charger. Hold on a second. You're right. No worries. Yeah, we, we, we had a plan to come there in 1986, I believe it was. And um, uh, Aussie got vocal notes. Um, right. He couldn't sing. In fact, not only could he not sing, um, his doctor told me he couldn't talk for like a month. So it, that, <laughs> it was for a guy that talks a lot, he was he was definitely frustrated with that. And in the meantime, we ended up um, we went to Hawaii. We were coming back from Japan. We ended up staying in Hawaii for um, we weren't supposed to be there, but we ended up staying there for I think about ten days. And then we came back to LA and we we got a house in LA and we stayed in LA until Ozzy was better again. And during that time, we were supposed to come to Australia, and they got cancelled. So I think that might have had something to do with it. And then um, after that, well, ironically, there's a side story, of course, is that um, we were in the middle of our tour with Metallica opening for us, and they decided mm. they didn't want to sit around for a month. So they went to do some shows in Scandinavia, and sadly, that's, those, those were shows during which Cliff had passed away. Yeah. They had the accident. So it's it's... It's remarkable. It's a sad thing, but it's a remarkable thing how one completely unrelated event can have disastrous, you know, consequences on the back end. I mean, if he hadn't lost his voice, you know, you know, then things might be very different to that. You know. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, look, and and another thing, just talking about Metallica, the the legend looms large, as you well know, about Cliff Burton and Metallica in that era, and. From their reputations perspective, that tour was the defining moment in their career. Yeah. Although, yeah. even though it, it had this huge tragedy surrounding it, were from your perspective though, do they is their reputation well earned? Were they the juggernaut that you were witness side side of stage every night back in those days? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was familiar with them being being a Brit because they broke in Britain a long mm. time before they broke in America, and so yeah. they were frequently in England. And uh, I, at the time, I'll be honest with you, I was like, well, wow, this is kind of very out of left field. It's very extreme compared to the sort of stuff that we were, you know, that was mainstream. But it was cool. You know, my friend actually was, the guy I grew up with uh, in England was uh, Cliff's um, roadie, he was his tech. And uh, we did a, you know, we actually uh, did, a, I think we did a radio show together with his Anyway. So later on, there we are in the States, and you know, Ozzy had a, a, a reputation at the time that if you could open on an Ozzy tour, that was pretty much a guaranteed slam dunk success move. Mm. You know, whether it was going to be Motley Crue or whether it was going to be 
And in this case, it was Metallica. And we just saw them explode. But that we did have definitely have different audiences. If you went out there during the Metallica show and you'd see all these, you know, denim jackets in the front few rows, and then all of a sudden they finish stop, they finish stop playing and the whole crew goes out on the stage and they start changing all of the gear around. And mm. correspondingly in the audience, the entire first three rows would change. It's a completely different looking people. And wow. it was like wow. girls. It was, it was, you know, so they definitely, um, um, I, I mean, it was, it was undeniable what was going on. They yeah. Were, they were fantastic. Well, it's, it's hard to get to the bottom of things sometimes with a band like Metallica because the legend just overtakes it. It happens when, whenever a band has a prominent member pass away, and I say this with the greatest of respect, forget about critical summary or analysis of their music or their situation, okay? They just become gods and legends. And Metallica, in my opinion, haven't really done anything of note really since that era. So mm. that's that's 35 years ago or something like that now, however long it is, almost 40 years ago. It's so it's so long ago, yet they've traded on this reputation and the fans, they get bigger every year. They're, they're a complete anomaly from the perspective that their entire career is built off the first three or four albums and these tremendous tours that they did for a very short and a condensed period of time. Yeah, that's, yet, that's pretty common though, isn't it? I mean, you, I, I could name half a dozen bands that have the same sort of characteristics you'd say that they the first two or three albums were you know mm. stellar milestones and then the, now they've they're enjoying an incredible amount of uh, incredible career based upon those without mentioning any names but I, I i see that happen quite a lot yeah it's frustrating from my perspective oh, look I, i'm a journalist in the day-to-day -day, okay I, I loosely call myself a music journalist i'm just a fan right who gets a great opportunity to do this but uh there, there are people like you who I wish were household names because of your contribution and the talent that you've got. Yet, it's just the way the world works. Where bands, if they've got, if they have something that happens at a, a, a moment in time, let's just call it a zeitgeist, it pretty much sets sets them up for good. And no matter what happens thereafter, commercially, they're assured success. It's just a very strange thing that I've noticed about the the music industry and also film as well. You know, some actors that haven't done anything good for for decades. Even longer. Yeah. Do you think cases. they haven't done? Any, I mean, do you think they haven't done anything good, or do you think it's just that people just don't accept, or or don't even want to know, or want to listen? Well, with Metallica, you mean, or no, with just generally with people who? Oh, who I don't know. I mean, it's it's a tough one because being a musician, that's what I focus on, and uh, so when I'm listening to Ozzy, I'm actually listening to you or Bob. Does that make sense? I'm actually not. It's not that I don't like what Ozzy does. I know I appreciate him as a figurehead and a fella out there as a front person. I understand all of that. He's never had the greatest voice, but I, I do love his charisma and I like his sense of humor, this sort of thing. But I'm a musician, okay? So when I'm listening, I'm listening to. I'm what. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking. How did you and Jake sit down and work out? You go there because I'm going here. This sort of the things that you talk about in rehearsal studios. I want. They're the sort of things that make my mind tick and. I, I so so I would develop a, a really a great respect for the work that musicians do in the studio, uh, rehearsal studio, and and the recording studio because I know how bloody hard it can be. Mm -hmm. And then when you see bands like Metallica who continue to be successful despite releasing very average a very average body of work now for such a long period of time, we, realistically post Black Album 1991, it's all been garbage. Yet the fans, no matter who they are, I've even done some critical stuff about Metallica. And yeah, you get hate mail. It's it's such a strange thing with some bands. Same thing happens, I think, with Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, you know, these really prominent bands. But then you go to the next level and people think like Jamie Lane. Uh, I can tell you, but people shit on Jamie. And it's it's terrible. It's you, They have no awareness or understanding of the, the true talent that these people have because they haven't dived into the catalogue and actually – taking some time out to absorb the music. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, people, you know, people get very personal with their music as well. If you say the wrong thing, people uh, feel like you've, uh, you've, you know, you've somehow insulted them personally or, and, or, and if you happen to support something and someone disagrees with you, sometimes they can get quite passionate with mm -hmm. you as well. And, uh, you know, very often we get on the receiving end of that stuff. I have to, I can't pay any attention to that kind of stuff, but, for obvious reasons it's you know that's you know it, it, i always remember that one line in the in david bowie the man who fell to earth remember the movie yeah yeah and uh at the, the end of the, at the end of the movie i think uh rip, rip Torn's character says to the bowie you know I, I heard your record 
he said, oh yeah, he said, I didn't like it that much. She went, yeah, I didn't like it. Either. You know, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, you, you're entitled to your opinion, but you can't, you know, play off of these things. You can't let that sway you. You know, the best thing that, the most inspirational thing to me is coming up with something that inspires me. I know it sounds like a, 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 a oxymoron or something, but, um, you know, like you're talking about rehearsal rooms, what makes Jake come up with something and me come up with another thing? How do we work that out? I don't know, but sometimes you're in a room and I'm playing something and the guitar player is playing something and you, you sit there and you go, oh my gosh, that sounds great. I don't need to tell you what to play. He doesn't need to tell me what to play, but there's a moment there. And that really is a sort of affirmation uh, or uh, uh, confirmation that, that you've got a good idea, that you've got something that's working. Mm. That's what it is. It's yeah. as simple as that. So, you know, it's the same as me picking up a guitar and playing through hours and hours of playing. And I go, oh, yeah, well, that sounds good. I can, I can work on this walk chord. Let me see. That's a one going into a flat and did go into, you know, a, a dominant fifth chord. It doesn't matter what it is. Mm. Eventually, all of a sudden, you hit something and say, wow, that's really cool. That, that's inspiring. And that's when you know you've got some. I yeah. mean, that's, that's how it works for me. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, no, I was just thinking back to last night. We just sometimes you get those moments where you uh, we we play covers. Okay, so we're a top forty band playing pubs and clubs around Brisbane and in Queensland. So we uh, the songs there. We're playing Harry Styles. You've got to play this stuff these days. You know how it is. It's all top forty, so you got to do this stuff. But it just, we just couldn't get it. We we tried and we'd learn all of the parts, but there's like 48 tracks of synth or something like that going through it. And they're these earworms that are going right through the song and you yeah. don't notice them there until you've actually got to try to put the song together yourself and you go, it sounds flat, we can't do it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's some of these things, that you've, you know, you've, they are arrangements, there's no doubt about it. And some of the things <laughs> are just so easy and natural, it's easy to play. And, you know, I don't know what's, what works best for everybody. I mean, something. So my solo material, sometimes I get so lost in these productions that I start to sit there and think, am I overcomplicating something or should it be mm. simpler? Should it be more straightforward? I don't know. It's Music is very definitely very diverse and it's, people get very passionate about it. Um, uh, and uh, and it's understandable. You know, I certainly did with my own, my own influences when I was growing up and uh, things I'm, I'm very passionate about. Uh, but I do respect that everyone has a different sort of thing. And I think that's very, very important. Yeah, no, great. Yeah. Hey, I've just got to know on the I've just got to know on the time because I've got to jet off to work soon. Uh, and yeah. for, we believe me, I've got a ton more questions I'll I would love to ask, but I'll ask this one here. Um yeah. you, you I, do I, You've had an extraordinary career, certainly, as far as I'm concerned, and there are so many highlights, you know, as I say. You've got the Billboard number one. You played in Ozzy's band. You've got uh, Billy Idol. You've done a, so many sessions. You've played on more recordings than people would care to name in terms of uh, you're one of those bases that I think all rock fans will have heard, even if they didn't intend to, because of the amount of sessions and stuff that you've done. So can you pick a career highlight? Every single there are, there are many career highlights. I mean, I think you nailed something, which is a lot of my influences were very diverse. You know, Shot in the Dark was, a, a, you know, originally um, conceived after, because I was listening to Al Jarreau albums at the time, and there were certain chord progressions that were very current, very sort of jazz fusion, but very mainstream at the time. And I was trying to incorporate them into a sort of rock idea. And that's why I think it became, it had that pop sensibility. Um, of course, Shot in the Dark, because it was such a success. Um, a, a song I wrote after you're gone for, for, for Toto that was nominated for a Grammy. That was mm. a highlight. Um, songs I wrote actually for uh, you know for other people. A couple of songs I wrote for Steve Luca, which I think are superlative songs where I'm really proud of what I wrote. And I think I really nailed the artistic thing of what I was trying to do. Those were highlights for me as well, even though they're not very well known. Um, so, and of course, last in line, I mean, all of these things are highlights for me and they're all highlights for different reasons, but it's all part of the same thing that, you know, there's certain things that excite you about certain aspects of music. And that's the beautiful thing about music is it's, it's, it's different every day. I mean, it's diverse every day. One day you get, you get off on the, the energy of a song. Another day you get off on the, you know, the, the melody of something, the harmonies of something that the catch that you've put into something, the hook that you've created, or the response that people, all of these things, it would be a, it would be a lie to say that these were, these were not all highlights. So 
I'm blessed to say that I've, I've had several highlights in my career and I, and I love that. So I'm very, very fortunate. I don't take it for granted. And I really um, appreciate when people are, um, uh, pay, me, pay compliments to that kind of stuff. I don't take it lightly. <laughs> Yeah, all accolades well earned, by the way. And actually, I'll make this my final question. Is there is there an intention, therefore, is it likely for us to be able to see you down here in Australia with Last in Line? I hope so. It's way, way, way been, well, we need to come over there. So we, we did, we've we been discussing it just prior to the pandemic. We were starting to get discussions about traveling further out. Australia was being mentioned, uh, as well as South America and back to the Far East again. But Australia was definitely being mentioned, and unfortunately, we had a pandemic and sadly we lost a uh, manager slash agent as well mm. who uh, passed away for unrelated reasons. But um, all of that kind of took a backseat. So we have to start from scratch again, but we'd love to come over there. I hope we can do so really soon. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah, me too. This has been a tremendous surprise. So I'm so thrilled that I've had this opportunity to finally talk to you, Phil. Ah. So you can tell I'm a fan. I just love your work, mate. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's really been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks Thanks so much, brother. Hopefully see you soon. Absolutely. Take care, okay? Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. That was a killer conversation with one of my favourite musicians ever, the great Phil Susan. Now, I can't say that there are heaps more over at Scars and Guitars like that one there, the website that is, because there isn't. That was just a once-off. I have a real thing for certain musicians like Lee Harrison from Monstrosity and Terrorizer. And Phil, Aussie's bassist, a couple of others. Doug Wimbish from Living Colour, mainly bass players, I've got to say, because I'm a bassist myself. But when you get a chance to have a a long form conversation and dive into so many aspects of their incredible career, you take it. And as I said in the introduction, I was riffing then. I didn't have any questions prepared. It was just what I knew off the top of my head. Let's go. So, yeah, do check out the other chats on scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading because I've written a book and I've got some more information to share with you about it before we go across and have a listen to why you should download a sample of the book. I need to bid you a fond farewell. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. Until next time, it's a very goodbye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Coal Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Yeah, wise words, uh, sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the the fans and the staying power of the the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, Playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very 
you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>